good. Uh, for context, if we were taking this online course, uh, there's a lot more discussion of like research papers and that. Uh, since you guys weren't really provided with those research papers nor time to read them, they're quite dense. We're going to kind of gloss over some of the research when necessary. Um, we'll still touch on some headline level looks, but for context, we skipped over the research portion of the first session just now. Um, since it was mainly focused on kind of redundancies of like neurodiversity and you know kind of exploring it through more of like the evidence-based lens. But I think we get the general emergent theme of like, you know, before we go about addressing an issue, let's try to make clear on, you know, is that issue uh, emergent from the individual? Is that emergent from the social context? And just kind of making more nuance as we start to analyze uh, the efficacy of these approaches, we have to kind of understand what are we labeling problematic? Is it the individual? Is it their environment? Etc. So the next lecture uh, that we're going to go through here between now and our 8 o'clock break is going to be looking at the past. And this is going to be a wide range of things. This is, this is the more research-focused section of tonight. Um, we're also like a bit of a trigger warning. We're talking about like some pre-prohibition era studies that are kind of like deeply unethical involving like uh, adolescent and uh, younger aged uh, individuals subjected to just kind of like let's see what happens-ism of uh, scientific research at that time. Uh, but it's important to look at, and it's important to kind of use as a stepping stone to where we are now. Uh, so, uh, before we do that, I'd like to invite us into another kind of simple mindfulness exercise. This is uh, a oxytocin release. Uh, oxytocin, for those of you guys who are not aware, occurs in response to the activation of sensory nerves as well as in response to the consumption of certain psychedelics, MDMA being a classic example of an oxytocin flood of trust and bonding and pro-social chemicals. Uh, there's many ways to self-induce oxytocin release, uh, including hugging and other such basic things. Uh, but one easy to do anywhere technique came from Dr. Julie Holland, who is also a MAPS advisor, medical advisor. She wrote a book called Good Chemistry, The Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics. And this technique uh, that she proposed was called havening. And the idea is you simply just cross your arms and like move from like the shoulder down to the elbow, kind of like repeatedly doing this kind of slowly and intentionally and drawing like awareness to like where that point of contact is. Just doing this for a period of time and you know you're just essentially the same comfort you might be provided by another individual in that same kind of container. There's a little bit of like a left right brain trick to it all to where you're sort of experiencing that same comfort of touch and you know it's quite soothing. And again working with individuals, especially adolescents, people that are maybe really uh, prone to aggression and other things like this. This can be like to me, like I turn into like a like a nice like waterfall of quicksand kind of feeling after a short time of just doing this. Um, and I think touch is something in autistic populations that's so often just plain missing. They're not getting social contact, let alone like physical touch contact. And that can be like really something that helps to regulate and stabilize these individuals and bring about security for them. You know, you see it in adaptive devices of like you know. Uh, stretch fit clothing, things that can kind of compress them, things like this. But it's just one more thing, the same way we were like, oh, nostrils, remember where your breath is. Like, this is one more kind of thing of just like, oh, like, havening, a nice, like, self-hug kind of exercise. Like, to me, like, I already feel more chilled out than I did two minutes ago. Um, but I am also guilty of not, like, being attentive to, like, my physical body as much as I probably should be in certain ways. So... Havening is one technique if you're interested in more. This whole book is basically all about like how you can use connection to like become psychedelics, basically. Um, and all this all the science that supports that like psychedelics are basically like mimicking like the neurological patterns and chemical releases of connection. Um, and to also be wary of like going so far that you're replacing connection and forming some sort of like addictive pattern with even psychedelics can come about. You know, there's definitely a positive press of like psychedelics can't be addictive. But anything can become dependence, and anything can become, you know, you don't want to always, you don't really want to lean too heavily on any one tool. Um, so it's just kind of important to kind of contextualize any of these things. Um, this you don't have to worry about right now, but when you get to the class, there's an essay at the end of my first book that kind of reflects back on the previous talk that we just had. It was an essay that I actually wrote after I published the first book, because the initial title was How LSD Helped Me Bridge the Autism and Typical Divide. Because at that point, I was deeply entrenched in the idea that I needed to become normal, and that was my deepest hope, was to be normal. Uh, after a while of like getting letters from people and thinking about it, I was like, that's actually, like I'm perpetuating harm with this. 
So I changed it to instead be like, oh, let's see how me to understand, navigate, alter, and yet still appreciate my autistic perceptions in the sense that like I might change perspective during an acute drug window, but I ultimately kind of return to what's my familiar kind of baseline processing in general. I might experience subtle changes over time the same way someone might meditate or if you drink coffee, you don't become like a permanently energetic person. But having access to coffee might mean you can have energy as needed. And same for psychedelics for me when it comes to like more somatic access, more social ease, things like this. Um, so that's just an essay on that. And it's free. It's on the website. And it'll be in the slide deck we'll provide you after the class as well. So this is just a super crude version of it. If you guys are attending this conference, you're going to hear a million other permutations of this. So this is probably the part I'm going to skip the most, probably, because you can find a million other people that are pharmacologists and better at all this stuff. I'm just going to purely speak about these substances as far as relevance to this particular population. Um, so again, psychedelic, we'll skip like these things, because these are just basic terms for psychedelic. Um, what might start to matter is that there's other terms that have been classified, again, uh, something like intactogen, uh, which is Greek for to generate touch within. It also can mean retrieval, uh, in other words, like retrieving, say, a traumatic memory, or retrieving, like, the somatic awareness that you're hungry, and things that, things like occupational therapy try to achieve uh, through other kind of embodiment practices. And things that, in some cases, like behavioral therapies, maybe miss the mark because they're rote memorization strategies rather than embodiment techniques. And so something that psychedelics could potentially facilitate is giving back that compass and that locus of control to the individual to be like, what do I do? And instead of looking for instruction, instead of looking to mimic something, they can actually locate their body and make a determination based on their somatic signaling. And that's going to be something that's a much more reliable tool for them to have with them all the time. I was heavily dissociated before I started utilizing LSD, and it took me many months to even get acclimated to remembering I had a body at all. Uh, it's a quite a bizarre phenomenon. Um, similar to a lot of people, though, I also had a lot of confounding trauma in my life. I was like physically attacked a lot as a child. And so there's a degree of just feeling safe enough to feel anything that I had to work through with a lot of MDMA and LSD work. Um, but in a very basic sense, you know, like every single time I take MDMA, I realize like I should not pack my backpack so heavy because my back sure hurts and stuff like this. It's like your body just basically tucks away stuff that's always signaling. It's just like that just must be normal now. But certain things like more nuanced perception of those norms can be really helpful. Um, and if individuals aren't in some sort of like yoga practice, meditation practice, anything that encourages them to scan their actual bodies, especially in public school where 99% of your day is spent just in mental space, and like and PE is just an afterthought and things like this, like we're, a lot of this is coming back to somatics. And intactogen is one term heavily is connotated with MDMA, but also psilocybin and LSD, uh, even DMT and like post acute windows. And pathogen as well. Uh, there's a thing called the double empathy problem in, in autism, which is the sort of the notion that autistic people, kind of borrowing from Dr. Walker's definition, might be having such an intense sensory experience that their capacity to process is debilitated. Not so much that they're not experiencing the sensation, but the sensation is a bit like a bandwidth issue. Like, they're getting so much input that, like, the body just shuts down. And so there's this sort of myth that, like, autistic people aren't empathetic or whatever it might be. Sometimes that perceived lack of empathy is something that's more rooted and something more cognitive, like the ability to deduce a situation or kind of make meaning out of multiple disparate parts in a social context. Sometimes it's also, like, purely, like, physiological, either because of that intensity of sensation or because they have a hyposensitivity to certain inputs. Um, I, I'm still trying to figure that out. You, you, all these psychedelics later, I'm still struggling a bit still with like, uh, I should probably eat, or I should probably have water, or like these basic things, um, which I should probably have water. And like, and, and it's something that is a recurrent thing. It's something that is really like rooted in some of those established patterns, those neurological norms that we have. Um, we won't go too far down the rabbit hole of like potentials of neurogenesis and new pattern formation, um, but empathogen just purely uh, is another term you might hear thrown around. It's something that is particularly important for those who are trying to kind of heal like social and interpersonal wounds that they might carry. Uh, entheogens are more related to religious, spiritual, shamanic contexts. This course is admittedly not as uh, leaning towards entheogenic practice, mainly because a lot of our definitions and things are coming from a heavily Western medicalized model. We're 
I'm, I'm introducing myself with a definition born inside of a medicalized model. <laughs> like those are my identities. And so this class is, doesn't really touch on too much of spiritual practice and that, just to honor it, to recognize it, and to find wisdom within it. And dissociative is just another uh, class of drug. Ketamine is under this category. Ketamine also has antidepressant effects. Um, but it's worth noting that effects of such drugs can also vary widely from person to person, that the classification of these drugs into specific categories is somewhat arbitrary, depends on dose and intent. And again, ketamine being one such, which is dissociative, but also has other complicated pharmacology I'm not going to get into because it's outside of my boundaries. Um, but it does have downstream outcomes where they're seeing antidepressant effects and other changes in other neurochemicals that are seemingly beneficial for other kinds of processing. So as we look at these specific compounds, um, again, this is like elementary stuff, so I'm going to just really just look at the top here, and the rest you can revisit later. Um, but a partial serotonergic agonist, in other words, it's going and it's binding to serotonin receptors. That's the kind of the primary mechanism that's recognized. If you're eating a whole fruit, psilocybin mushroom, there's a whole lot of other stuff happening. We're just barely beginning to understand all the other complex things beyond just psilocybin doing something. Um, but for the sake of it, uh, it has that mirroring uh, with LSD. Uh, and LSD is another partial agonist. And what's key about the partial uh, serotonergic agonists is that uh, they're partial insofar as after a sufficient level has been uh, like topped off, then like the so also will the drug like evacuate uh, the system without any sort of known overdose for either of these drugs. There's certainly extreme adverse outcomes. Someone once snorted a line of LSD that was crystal. And it was like 550 hits of conventional LSD. They went into like two weeks of like essentially like a whiteout, and they were like body heat fluctuations, but they were physiologically just fine. Uh, they didn't have any long term detriment other than just missing two weeks of their lives. Uh, and again, that's taking an extreme, extremely a lot of LSD. Um, similarly, like uh, again, we're not like advising these levels, but with mushrooms, it's like there's no known uh, overdose short of like really taking like grand like pounds and pounds. At that point, you'd like die of like a stomach inflation before you would die of like the active compounds. Not to say there isn't dangers and cardiological complications for these drugs, but just for the sake of total simplicity here, we're just kind of saying these are relatively safe, known to be low on the neurotoxicity scale compounds. Um, and they're introduced here uh, because uh, they have effects on uh, social processing, uh, somatic processing, and we'll talk in more depth as we go along. Um, again, bear with me, I'm just skipping slides, but these slides will be presented to you, and we have August together as well. I just want to make sure we kind of get a well-rounded story today. Uh, and MDMA is probably going to be, again, we're not trying to be biased, whatever it may be, but MDMA is probably going to be a very primary impact in this population very quickly, probably even more than psilocybin. Uh, from what we understand from those comorbidities, we didn't touch on that, it's in this other book, so... Uh, there are elevated rates of bipolar, schizophrenia, other things that are contraindicated for psilocybin and LSD use in autistic populations. So we essentially have to treat any human that's about to take any of these drugs with the same medical screener, not make any assumptions, not exclude them based on anything uh, that we empirically know just yet. There's no clear indication that shows that autistic people ought to be like a contraindication for any medicine, because it's essentially like saying someone who behaves this way it, that emergent behavior could be any neurological route, could be anything like gut health related. So there's not, it's not as easy to classify like an autistic person shouldn't do this. It's much easier to be like someone who has epilepsy probably shouldn't take MDMA. Or there's like much easier and more established like kind of empirically known things about these, but very rarely are we touching on um, autism itself being like the screener thing that gets someone removed. Uh, the exception of that being like retreats and things, and we're trying to fill this need actively, a lot of retreats might uh, exclude someone from a retreat on the basis of perceiving it as like a more challenging guest to accommodate on their retreat. So we're trying to be like, well, we'll take the super difficult people and make them feel not difficult, and that will probably help them. It's just a process that we have to kind of work through together, because there are challenges. We've had like kind of our own friendly gatherings with ourselves where no one's really the healer, but we're taking care of each other in community. And it's admittedly hard when you get 12 people with radically different nervous systems trying to, like, cohabitate. <laughs> it's pretty wild. <laughs> you know, like, we're all, like, in our own, like, little space, like, headphones and sunglasses, and, like, we need 17 rooms for all 17 of us. Like, it's difficult sometimes, and, and everyone's, like, going in and out of regulation. It can be admittedly more challenging to work with these populations. However, 
that ought not be a, like a pure exclusion for these populations either. It's, a, it's really just a matter of accommodating those differences. Um, which, as you might find, my mind wanders very far from what I'm supposed to be talking about. But we were talking about MDMA, and, uh, and again, it's most classically used and tested within uh, trauma healing. And MAPS has done an excellent job of bringing it just about all the way through to FDA approval by midway through next year, is the thinking. Um, and they, I heard, the last I heard Rick talk, he said 2036 for like recreational like dispensary access, if we can prove ourselves responsible enough to get there, um, which would be wonderful. Um, but again, skipping over the finer points, ketamine, another thing that we hear about a lot in our community group, uh, mainly because it's legal, it's accessible. Um, for certain use cases, esketamine from Johnson & Johnson is uh, covered by insurance if it's taken with an SSRI in tandem. There's a lot of limitations still with it, a lot of it's out of pocket, and a lot of people are getting ketamine services without adjunctive therapy, so it's kind of a slippery slope into like another crutch. And so there's lots of things to be wary of about it. Um, this is not a ketamine class, but for the sake of contextualizing this, be aware that ketamine has utility from like an intervention standpoint for like suicidality. Um, some people also just have a lot of other comorbidities where it's really helpful, chronic pain, anything that can essentially be like a, a holiday from the nervous system, ketamine is that. It's an anesthetic. It's like, it's utilized. Another thing worth pointing out in this population is that ketamine has been tested in adolescents all the way down to age five because it is a general anesthetic and it's well tolerated. Uh, some, uh, some anesthesiologists will actually say that like, ketamine is their preferred with uh, youth groups because like kids don't seem to be weirded out by weird stuff that happens when they're on ketamine. <laughs> um, and like, and it's just well tolerated, we know this. And there are case studies of individuals with like suicidality that are 14, that they're like, nothing's working, but we can give them ketamine, and they do, and it does get results. Um, it's just rare for, you know, it's at the risk tolerance of the doctor at this point. Um, and it's just a weird anomaly of how like, you know, something that's on-label, off-label, insurance coverage, all this other stuff is an anomaly, um, which we'll touch on a little later. And ayahuasca, again, recognizing my own naivety of having never used this medicine and just respecting like their lineage traditions, just to, just to say that like based on the anecdotes with my database of some 7,000 reports, there's plenty of people that have benefited from ayahuasca for a lot of these same things that we're learning, whether it's the embodiment that comes about uh, during and following sessions or some of the neurogenerative properties of any of these 2A agonists. Um, any and all of these things can play that role in that psychological flexibility and that kind of like ability to formulate new patterns and, and establish new patterns. That sort of neurological rehabilitation piece is present in ayahuasca. That's the medical version. You could also go very deeply into the spiritual side of ayahuasca, obviously. Um, but for the sake of contextualizing this course and by virtue of me speaking mostly through the scientific lens, just more naming it and recognizing that there are indeed a lot of benefits that we see and no clear contraindication similarly um, and within this population. And DMT and 5-MeO-DMT uh, are powerful visionary compounds found in also in a variety of plants and animals. So there's the bufo virus, toad, and others. Um, but mainly uh, DMT and 5-MeO are being looked at right now in the pharmaceutical biotech world. Uh, because they're showing some of the same uh, plasticity inducing effects as some of these other compounds, but with like a 10 minute session uh, that could be administered and then like in, in the post-acute window there could be that opportunity for the ingraining of new patterns uh, potentially. All of this is a grand stroke of conjecture. If I was at the other building explaining this stuff, I would not be able to be making these sorts of things. Like, please don't take this as like claim or anything. This is more like background, context, loose trajectory of where we're targeting research, not what we're looking to deliver in on care right now. Um, so this is just more of like, talk to me in 15 years when there's like a DMT clinic across the street and it's normal. Um, we'll probably get a lot more naturalistic data from like Oregon. In like a year of Oregon, we're gonna get more than we've ever known in the history of psychedelic research as far as this population would go. Um, so we're on the cusp of kind of cracking into that. So, as I said, this section is a little research heavy, um, but that's all right. Uh, all these papers are available um, as well, but don't feel the need to look at them now. They're, they're all like full-blown papers. They're all open access, intentionally so, so that you guys can go deep on them if you'd like. So really, as we go through this next section, I'm just gonna kind of give you like a headline glance 
uh, for about the last 10 years I've had Google Scholar or the alerts set up, kind of like you follow people on Twitter, I follow like scientists, <laughs> and like every time a keyword comes up or a mechanistic thing or someone else's work is quoted somewhere, I just read, like every morning I read all the abstracts in my inbox, just to be like, what else is there? And recently, ChatGPT made me feel stupid because like it basically did just as good as like my 10 years of doing this. But uh, like essentially, this is born from you know looking at a lot, a lot of multidisciplinary kind of studies. Uh, because a lot of people that I have spoken with in the field, it's dawned on me being not a person that had to specialize. I'm realizing how much specialists have to like not be very knowledgeable about a lot of other fields as well. So although I'm a generalist, I pride myself on kind of weaving together a lot of these themes and trying to kind of make something of a useful map. Um, but we start with the pre-prohibition era, which I mentioned again, somewhat of a trigger warning for these studies. This was the LSE and UML treatment of hospitalized disturbed children in 1963. And this was, again, uh, LSE was synthesized in 38, uh, Hoffman tried it himself in 43, and from 43 all the way until the Drug Act, it, you could just order LSD if you were a psychiatrist, psychologist, for any and all reason. And so people did, and, you know, Bill W., there's a great talk from, uh, I forget his name, but he has a talk called Bill W. Psychonaut, all about Bill W.'s history with LSD and finding higher powers, all this, but takeaway is, this was done during that same window where it was like, you can order LSD as long as you report on what happens when you use it, or when you use it with your patients. So there's a lot of like kind of wacky open trials that were happening during this time. So this study looked at LSD and UML. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, UML is just another ergot-derived medicine. Ergot is a mold that grows on rye, so LSD is a fungus, it's just a synthesization of that fungus downstream. Uh, but this was administered in children 6 to 12. The children had varying degrees of support needs and language capacity. Many of them were unresponsive to their environment, had disorganized habits. Uh, most individuals had low score on standard psychological tests, and the subjects were given LSD or UML. In treatment sessions with uh, daily LSD dosing increased from 60 micrograms up to 150 daily. So for people that have like ever taken LSD, they're like, wow, <laughs> dosing people every day is pretty wild. Um, and yeah, it's probably... Um, there is an eventual arc where they could theoretically arrive to a place where, you know, there's certain medications that upon first dosing are going to be quite impactful, and then upon kind of acclimating and getting into the tolerance window, become kind of like, just kind of stable in terms of, um, kind of having a metabolic effect that sustains without like the visual or auditory distortions and that. So this study is worth looking at, if nothing else, that it's like, this happened, so like, I mean, we should at least like, like recognize it, but also recognize like the deep flaws of doing research like this in this way. We have much better standards now that are like, okay, we'll test this in this way, and, and we'll test it only in the people that is like last resort treatment for. Everything is much more weighted as like risk versus benefit. Um, and these individuals were like, essentially, this was like one flew over the cuckoo's nest era of like psychiatry. Um, but nonetheless, the reports that they got from those who were administering these compounds uh, were that there was changes in responsiveness to their environment, increased alertness, awareness, interest in others. Um, both of the drugs seemed to have effect on their behavior, psychological functioning, um, and there were adverse events uh, such as like intense anxiety, confusion, tantrum-like behaviors, which again, looking at the dosing and the fact that like we don't know. A lot of the work that I have done in terms of like either in the underground or in any other context is like supporting people in community care. We very infrequently encounter people that would be in like level three or even sometimes level two. The DSM has three levels and those levels are associated with how much support needs do you have. Um, so most often those in the level three category typically don't have language, typically don't have like even like certain things like AAC, like assistive devices might be a challenge for level three. Um, so all this is to say that this particular study was done in a group of individuals, which at the time was referred to as like refractory, like they were essentially like there was no hope of them ever gaining a shred of like independent agency in their lives. They were just basically spoon fed at all points and like, uh, like washed, bathed and all of these things. Um, and probably in a darker period of time, not that long prior to this decade, many of these individuals might not have like made it through their childhood's period or past being like born or things like this. Um, so these were really difficult scenarios, and um, you know, again, serious issues about consent, informed consent, most especially um, different diagnostic criteria. These individuals had uh, what at the time was referred to as autism, autism schizophrenia. It was a combined type at that time. 
um, and as well, uh, dosing amounts is rarely regularly seen. I've never heard of anyone dosing in that way. Uh, I've, I've heard of people trying to and becoming quickly exhausted, debilitated, or developing like HPPD or serotonin syndrome. Uh, it doesn't seem advisable to dose in that regimen at all, short of what we might learn from future science. Um, but uh, again, the study is limited to the assessment of just the observance. They weren't taking like you know blood concentration levels of anything. There was no brain imaging. It was really just kind of like watching children play in a room after they had given them LSD. It's not the most useful study, but it took place, and uh, it's like recognizing you know not only that there were changes that might be interesting, but also like the, just recognizing it as a learning of like let's not go backwards uh, towards uh, a similar study that was done in that.